We're starting on the shoot growth types and patterns section. There's three main categories or three ways we can categorize shoot growth patterns in most temperate tree species. And that's determinate, indeterminate, and recurrently flushing shoot growth patterns. For determinate shoot growth, start by envisioning a shoot with a terminal bud that has overwintered. So that bud has, was set in the late summer or early fall and has some number of primordial or preformed leaves in it. So we're starting in the spring with that overwintered bud. In these schematics, I'm, the overwintered bud has 10 primordial leaves in it. Now, most overwintered buds will have many more leaves in it than 10, but just for the purposes of illustration, I'm, I'm having 10. So we have that overwintered bud and it uh, opens in the spring. Those primordial leaves expand and grow due to the action of an intercal of intercalary meristems. And eventually a bud is set and that bud overwinters the following winter. So for determinate shoot growth, all of the shoot growth that occurs in a growing season occurs from leaf primordia and shoot units that exist in the overwintered bud. So if you could non-destructively go in and count the number of primordial leaves in the bud, and then count the number of fully expanded leaves at the end of the growing season, they would be the same. So by definition, that is determinate shoot growth. A number of species have determinate shoot, shoot growth. So some Northern pines like red pine or Eastern white pine, for example, uh, most of the spruces, firs and birches, some um, acer or maple species are determinate. Um, one, one thing to think about is all of those examples that I've given are either uh, in the temperate zone, more northern latitude species or species that grow at higher elevation. So one way to think about the shoot growth pattern is that it's an adaptation to relatively short growing seasons. This is a mechanism for producing a flush of growth in a growing season relatively rapidly and then setting a bud in time to avoid frost that might occur late in the growing season. So those species that have determinate shoot growth very often are in those types of, of environments, cold environments where you're likely to get an early season frost. So there's an example of Pacific silver fir, Abies amabilis, it's a true fir. And looking at these branches, uh, this one's pretty clear. So this is one year's worth of growth. It's a determinate species. This is another year's worth of growth here. This is another year's worth of growth. This is a year's worth of growth and so on. Okay, it's an evergreen, so there may be multiple years worth of growth retained on any particular branch. In this case, sometimes maybe a, a dozen years, but the foliage produced in any particular year is pretty clear because it's just one growth cycle. That's determinate growth. With indeterminate growth, all of these start with the overwintered bud. So with indeterminate growth, we have that overwintered bud in this example, it has 10 primordial leaves. That bud expands, but then at that point, rather than setting a bud, we get continuous production and expansion of new primordia. And essentially that continuous production and expansion, expansion of new primordia occurs as long as conditions are suitable for growth. So that continuous expansion occurs as long as, as the growing season has favorable conditions until eventually 
some environmental signal is reached and a terminal bud is set that then overwinters. So that indeterminate growth occurs in poplars, uh, apple, sweet, sweet gum, larch, uh, eastern hemlock. So one thing to note is that most seedling growth for whatever species are indeterminate. So in their seedling stage, even determinate species may have indeterminate growth in their seedling form. So determinate species tend to become determinate when they become mature. So that's indeterminate shoot growth pattern. And then the third pattern is recurrently flushing. So for recurrently flushing shoot growth pattern, again, you start with the overwintered bud with some number of primordia and that bud expands those primordia expand and a resting bud is set. But then usually during that growing season, that resting bud will also expand and create a new cycle of shoot growth in that same growing season. And then that bud, that resting bud may overwinter or you may repeat this process one or more times. So what that means is that you may have two or more growth cycles of expansion of a resting bud, the resting bud sets and then expands again. That may happen multiple times in a growing season. That pattern is typical of most Southern pines. The so Southern pines have a recurrently flushing shoot growth patterns, pattern. There's some subtropical angiosperms that have this pattern as well. So this is sort of similar to the indeterminate shoot growth pattern in that it allows for production of new growth as long as growing conditions are favorable. But in this case, there's that resting bud that for some short period of time pauses growth. So in this case, the growth cycles are more distinct but you will have multiple, you may have multiple ones during a growing season. I've seen some, especially young, intensively managed loblolly pine, you might have five or six cycles of recurrent growth during a single growing season. Here's an example of data for slash pine showing growth rate. So this is growth rate. It's not absolute growth. So this is centimeters in growth between measurements. What you can see is that for 1982, for example, this is growth rate. He's calling it the spring shoot. That's that overwintered bud expansion. And then while it's still growing, a bud was set and a second flush of growth occurs in 1982. So in this case, there's in this, this young plantation, there's in both 1982 and 1983, there's two flushes or cycles of growth. In this mature plantation, you can see in 1982, there was expansion of that overwintered bud and then what he's calling a summer shoot or a second flush of growth in 1982, but in 1983, there was just expansion of one growth cycle. So as, as those slash pine mature, you might not see as many growth cycles. So like I said, it, it varies depending on species and condition. Younger trees tend to have more growth cycles and more intensively managed pines will have probably more growth cycles, especially when they're young. So there's some variability. This is uh, data from a uh, Henry Galt's paper from the 1980s. In some cases, you might have what some textbooks call abnormal late season shoots. Note that abnormal is, is a human term. This is perfectly normal for the trees, but essentially 
what that's referring to is, for instance, Lammas shoot growth. So Lammas shoot growth refers to the situation where you have a determinate species, but this bud that's set at the end of the growing season, because of abnormal late season conditions, usually either an abnormally warm uh, fall or a lot of rain in the fall, this bud may actually break and expand in the fall. And that, that's what's referred to as Lammas growth, is the expansion of a terminal bud that would have normally overwintered for that species. It's notable because that can sometimes result in winter in injury to that Lammas growth in the late fall. Uh, so when those conditions cause expansion of that bud, that tissue may not be hardened off and resistant to cold damage. And then you might have then winter injury to that Lama shoot in the late fall. In addition, because um, weather patterns are changing with climate change, we may be seeing more frequently that type of late season growth uh, in the fall and, and Lama shoots occurring. This is somewhat related to, I wanna talk a little bit about apical dominance. So I referred in the first lecture to apical dominance, which just refers to the suppression of growth of lateral branches by the terminal bud, by hormones produced in the terminal bud. And apical dominance is expressed in X, in X current crown form. So this is an X current crown form, sort of a classical Christmas tree shape. That's an expression of strong apical dominance versus, for instance, this elm type shape is an expression of weak apical dominance. So apical dominance just refers to the suppression of lateral branch growth by hormones produced in the terminal bud. And that, can, that tends to result in this sort of Christmas tree type shape. Now, in some cases, you may get a situation where you lose apical dominance. And that may occur when there's damage or loss of the terminal bud due to things like insects or mechanical damage uh, due to a storm, for instance, or due to um, wind damage, for instance. So all of those things may result in loss of the terminal bud, and that can cause loss of apical dominance. So if this terminal bud is lost, it's no longer producing those hormones, that then may result in those lateral branches basically assuming dominance and growing upwards. So think about then what type of crown form results when you lose apical dominance. That can result in a fork. So for, this is a picture of, for instance, a forked, a fork in the stem of a Douglas fir. You can basically see how that terminal bud was killed at some point and two lateral branches went for it. They started growing upward because they were no longer being suppressed by the terminal bud. That's how forks result. So forks result from the loss of apical dominance. Think about a situation where, for instance, the terminal bud is killed but in this case, one of the um, lateral branches, for whatever reason, starts growing faster. Once that lateral branch starts growing faster, it may start exerting apical dominance and start, and start suppressing the growth of other lateral branches. When that happens, you can end up with a crook in the stem. And a crook is basically sort of an S-curve in the stem. So when you see an S curve in the forest, that's a situation where one of those lateral branches that started growing won the race 
and started exerting apical dominance. So that's another example of how loss of apical dominance can influence stem form. A more extreme example is in, is in your handout. This is a spruce tree that was subjective to repeated pine weevil attacks. So basically, when this spruce tree was a seedling, pine weevils attacked the terminal bud and killed it. And that resulted in loss of apical dominance and laterals starting to grow upward. And then that pine weevil repeatedly killed those terminal buds. And that has basically over time resulted in a bush due to repeated loss of apical dominance in that spruce tree in this case. So that's another sort of extreme example of how loss of apical dominance can sort of destroy the classical crown form that a spruce tree would, would normally have. Okay. So the next um, term is phylotaxis. Want to talk a little bit about phylotaxis. Phylotaxis is just the pattern of arrangement of plant parts around a central axis. So that can ref refer to, for instance, patterns of branching. Uh, so we often say, refer to phylotaxy in terms of a tree species having opposite branching phylotaxy or alternate branching phylotaxis or world uh, branching phylotaxis, for example. But phylotaxy can also refer to the arrangement of, for instance, cone parts or floral parts around a central axis. Uh, in this case, these are uh, pine cones. And you can see those cone elements are arranged in spirals around the set central axis of that cone. And interestingly, those phylotactic arrangements of plant parts in a spiral tend to be governed by mathematical relationships. And one important mathematical arrange, uh, relationship that governs the arrangement of plant parts in phylotactic spirals is a sequence of numbers that's arranged like this. So where the sequence is 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. That sequence of numbers, what is that sequence of numbers called? Where basically each number is the sum of the previous two numbers in the sequence. That refers to, a, that's called a Fibonacci series. And the Fibonacci series um, defines a number of phylotaxis patterns. So a number of these spiral arrangements that we see in nature, like the head, seed heads in a sunflower, or patterns in seashells sometimes, often follow a Fibonacci sequence in terms of the number of, for instance, spirals in one direction versus the number of spirals in, an, in another direction. And there have been arguments about why that mathematical arrangement uh, occurs in a number of different situations. And as it turns out, there have been arguments, does this, for instance, in plant shoots, does that minimize self-shading? Uh, what, what, why does that recur in nature? And a number of modeling studies have basically come down to the fact that this Fibonacci series ends up being close to, opt an, close to optimum arrangement for basically being able to closely pack units around a spiral in a tight space, like a terminal bud. So it turns out that that Fibonacci series is close to optimum for packing, for instance, cone pieces into, a, into primordial units in a, in a terminal bud or close packing of stem units like primordial leaves in a terminal bud and so on. So that's a 
a pattern that has recurred in evolution as an optimum for packing small units into small spaces like a bud. So that doesn't always apply just for trees. It applies across the plant kingdom, but it's an interesting recurring mathematical relationship. So I want to talk a little bit about phenology. So I'm going back to your notes for the phenology portion. Uh, so let's just define phenology. So phenology just refers to the timing, usually within a year of the growth and reproductive events of a plant or animal. So many organisms have a timing of their growth and reproductive events, certainly throughout their lifetime, but also usually within a year. Certain events like flowering, initiation of growth, cessation of growth, those tend to occur at about the same time every year. And that refers, that process and that timing is phenology. And there's a number of things that influence phenology. So temperature during the year can certainly influence phenology. That's off, often measured by degree days, which is sort of like an accumulation of warmth during a year, or sort of the opposite, chilling hours. Both of those can inf influence fruiting or flowering in some species. So temperature can, can be really important. Day length can be important. We'll talk later on in a little more detail about how day length is measured. It actually ends up being dependent on the length of the dark period. But essentially, that measures day length. So the day length can also influence some phenological events. So some events like late wood formation in trees is influenced by soil moisture. Also cessation of growth at the end of the year can be influenced by soil moisture, for instance. And then genetics is almost always important. So different species have different phenological patterns, but genetics also influences how, for instance, temperature and soil moisture affect phenology. So really, phenology ends up being affected by the interaction of both environmental and genetic influences. And as the climate changes, it's also important to remember that as climate changes, long-held observations of phenology or long held, long observed patterns of phenology may change because climate is changing. And phenology is interesting because phenological patterns in plants and animals have been observed for a long time. It doesn't require any special tools. People in their diaries would write when their orchard flowered, for instance. And those records have been kept for decades and in some cases, centuries. So it's interesting then that some of the first observations of climate change occurred in phenology. So one of the papers that first really 
influenced me to understand how climate change was affecting plants and animals was this paper by Parmesan and Yoey that basically summarized changes in phenology across all living things. So they summarized, summarized phenological changes in woody plants, herbaceous plants, birds, insects, amphibians, and fish. And basically said, how have phenological observations over human record keeping changed over the last, for instance, century? And they found that in this case, these are change in the direction predicted. So this was, OK, if climate is changing or getting warmer, how do we expect those changes to occur? So we expect, for instance, growth to start earlier or flowering to occur earlier because it's warmer. And they found that across many, across several kingdoms, we were seeing changes that were consistent with changing climate. We were also seeing changes in, for instance, the distribution of plants, animals, um, further north, for instance, or further up in elevation associated with changing climate. So this was a really synthetic paper that said, we're seeing lots of changes in these plants and animals that are consistent with changing climate. So phenological observations were really important for detecting climate change effects across a broad range of types of life. Here's another example of changes in phenology associated with the change in environment. In this case, this was in an irrigation experiment in Loblolly Pine. And what, this sh what was found in this study was that with irrigation, these trees continued growing later into the growing season. And what this meant was when they continued growing later into the growing season, that allowed them to put on more late wood in their tree rings. Now, this is secondary growth, and I'll talk about late wood in the next lecture, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Basically, what this showed was that the more irrigation that was put on, the longer into the growing season these trees growed, grew, and the more late wood they put on. So this is a great example of soil moisture influencing the phenology of growth of, in this case, loblolly pine. Here's another example of environmental influences on phenology. In this case, this is Sitka spruce. And this shows the natural range of Sitka spruce. Sitka spruce grows within a few miles of the coast in the Pacific Northwest from Northern California all the way up into Alaska, really long latitudinal range. And this study, was a common garden experiment. So great thing about common garden experiments is that you can take material from throughout the range of a species. And this is what they did. They took material from throughout the range, the latitudinal range, and planted them together in one place. So this shows that they each of these dots is a seed source from throughout the range of Sitka spruce planted, in this case in Germany, is where the common garden was. But what you can see, this is the latitude of the seed source. So the latitude from 41 degrees down here in Northern California, all the way up to 59 degrees here in Southern Alaska. And what you can see is that in this common garden, they measured the date of cessation of growth of these Sitka spruce seedlings. And what you can see is the further south, those seed sources, the later in the year they stopped growing. Whereas the seedlings that were derived from seed sources from further north, they stopped growing earlier in the growing season. And that makes sense. 
those northern seed sources are adapted to a growing environment where there's frost earlier in the growing season. So there's local adaptation of those seed sources. But you can see there's a gradual adaptation to changes in environment, in this case, the date of first frost for these different seed sources. So that's the effect of latitude, which is really temperature of those different latitudes um, on cessation of growth. So common garden studies allow us to detect genetic adaptation or variation within the range of a species in this case. And this is a great example of that genetic and environmental control over phenology, in this case, date of cessation of growth. Another example of latitudinal effects of growth uh, are this study of phenology in um, white ash in a common garden in Kansas. But in this case, these are collections from across the range of white ash from warmer places like Mississippi, Georgia, and South Carolina, all the way up into cooler places like Maine, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So in this case, white ash, um, another species with a big range, natural range, and they collected that material and grew it in a common garden and measured the date, date of leaf emergence. And again, you can see that the date of leaf emergence in the seed sources from warmer places, the leaves emerge earlier in the growing season. And from the cooler seed sources like um, Wisconsin and Michigan, they emerge uh, a little bit later in the year, which again, makes sense. But in this case, so that's that genetic control of phenology changes depending on where those seed sources are and where the local adaptation is associated with those growth environments. But here there's a twist. In 2012, there was a heat wave. So it was an unusually warm growing season. During that heat wave, we see the same pattern with emergence, leaf emergence being earlier in the year in those more, from those more warmer seed sources, but it occurred much earlier in the year during that year when there was a heat wave. So that heat wave basically shifted the phenology of all of those seed sources earlier in the year to where it is in essence, those um, cold seed sources were emerging at about the same time as the warm season seed sources were emerging in a normal year. So this is an example where as climate changes and we get um, you know, more heat waves, that also is going to alter phenology of plants. So I think this is a really nice example of how heat waves and changes in temperature regimes associated with changing climate are going to interact with the genetics of phenology. So we're really going to have to pay attention as managers, for instance, to how climate change will interact with genetics of phenology in this case. So nice study here by Carter et al to take a look at that really nicely quantifies that interaction.